Good afternoon. Hopefully we'll hear a little bit more noise as the students uh, get out of class uh, and begin to uh, file in. Um, it gives me uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Erica Schwartz. Over the past 30 years, uh, Dr. Schwartz has written four best-selling books, testified before Congress, hosted her own PBS pledge special on bioidentical hormones, and appeared on various news programs, including CBS News, Larry King Live, CNN, MSNBC, as well as The View, and Oprah Satellite Radio with Dr. Oz and many, many others. Her journey to become a leader and an innovator in her field began in a one-room apartment in Bucharest, Romania, where Dr. Schwartz dreamed of becoming a doctor like her uncle in America. Her family escaped Ceausescu's communist regime when she was 16 years old, and she arrived in Rome speaking four languages, none of them English. Dr. Schwartz first came to the U.S. after graduating from the Overseas School of Rome and was accepted to NYU on a full academic scholarship. She received her MD in 1975 from SUNY Downstate's College of Medicine, graduating cum laude, and as a member of Alpha Omega Alpha, the Honor Society uh, of uh, Medical School. She completed her training in internal medicine and critical care at Downstate Kings County Hospital Center. In 2005, Dr. Schwartz was honored by the College of Medicine Alumni Association with the Lewis M. Hellman MD Master Teacher Award. She delivered the address this year at the white coat ceremony for Downstate's entering medical students, and she is a past president of the Downstate Alumni Association. Dr. Schwartz currently sees patients from all over the world, uh, and recently uh, she and her partner opened uh, an office in London, England. Over the past 30 years, she has personally cared for 100,000 patients. Uh, she's treated more than 15,000 patients and continues to have an active practice here in New York City as well as in Florida. Dr. Schwartz's subject is her new book, Don't Let Your Doctor Kill You, which addresses the question, quote, how do you take charge of your health and stop turning over your life to our confusing and intimidating healthcare system before it's too late? This book will be available uh, for purchase, and Dr. Schwartz will uh, be available to sign some copies. She also has time to volunteer, donates her time giving lectures uh, and giving seminars uh, and treating patients who can't afford access to health care. On a personal note, she is a warm, caring, and totally enjoyable human being and I'm very proud uh, to call her my friend, Dr. Erica Schwartz. Hi. I'm really honored to be here because I never in my wildest dream thought that I would ever stand in front of you yet again. I never thought that I would be doing part of the uh, graduation address two years ago when um, as president of the Alumni Association, I had the privilege of sending off the medical students onto their careers as doctors. And I talked about the doctor-patient relationship and not forgetting the fact that you're taking care of human beings. And then the honor of giving the white coat ceremony this year was amazing. And the topic that I chose was, how are you feeling? And I don't know how many of you doctors here actually ask your patients how they're feeling. I think we got it. it's a lost art. And I'd like to bring it back. And I'd like to talk about why did I write Don't Let Your Doctor Kill You, what it's about, and what, if anything, we can learn from it. So first of all, I don't know if you guys remember, and you know, there are no medical students really here, which is a shame, because I wanted to start by saying we all learn from stories. You know, there is evidence-based medicine, there are protocols, there's the educational process that we put everybody through, but the truth is we learn from stories. We remember our storytellers, 
the storytellers are the ones who make the difference. So I wrote, you know, I mean, the Daily Mail is serialized the uh, Don't Let Your Doctor Kill You. And I was reading the comments, there were like zillions of them, and everybody agreed. And they all actually read it, you know, take it literally, don't let your doctor kill you. I'll explain to you what's not literal about it. The other level, layers of it. Anyway, and somebody wrote, well, those who cannot take care of patients, teach. And those who cannot teach, write. I guess that was an insult meant at me. But this is the thing, I can teach, I can write, and I take care of patients. So I really didn't take it personally. The problem is, though, the title still stands straight here, right in front of you. And it took me literally almost 20 years to publish the book. And it's changed a lot while I was working on it. Why would I, a doctor, who's actually conventionally trained, who believes in prevention, who may be at odds with a lot of the teachings of our current medical school, educational system, our in, you know, medical industrial complex, why would I actually go out and actually write this book? So first of all, let me tell you what I mean by don't let your doctor kill you. Yeah, you all understand. Kill you, do the wrong thing, give you the right, wrong medication, um, do the wrong surgery, we know. We've all been there as doctors. We know what that looks like. But it's really not a book that's only for the public. The public will read the book because they're already sick and tired of our present medical system and our healthcare system. They're just sick of it. They can't stand it anymore. They don't want to be victims anymore. So they, they'll buy it because it only reaffirms what they already believe. But this is about doctors. This is for doctors. This book is actually for us. I wrote it because I wasn't going to go out of here with a career as long as mine, with as much experience as I have, without sharing with you the fact that we, the doctor part of us, is killing us. So I want you to think for a minute, like, what does she mean by that? And as such, I'm going to tell you some stories while you're thinking about it. So the first story is that on May 15th, 1971, different century, different world, um, I received a certified letter from 450 Clarkson Avenue. And I knew what it was. I took it in my hand. It happened to be my mother's birthday. I took it in my hand, and I was like, oh my god, I got into medical school, and I got into downstate, and I wanted to go to downstate, because downstate was the place for me. I had interviewed at NYU, interviewed at Einstein, interviewed everyone in the city. I got in some of them, but you know what? Downstate is where I wanted to go. Because downstate, I believed, was where we, I would learn to be a doctor that actually takes care of patients, that has the ex gains the expertise necessary to become a really good doctor. The experience came from downstate. So anyways, I got into downstate, and. I was telling Jean on the way, my assistant on the way here, it was the number one best day of my life. And I, it, I never changed. I've had two children, I've been married, I, there are a lot of other great, really, days in my life, the white cone ceremony. But the truth is, it was the best day of my life. I would get the opportunity to become a doctor. And yet, what happened? I love being a doctor, I still love it. I love going to work every day, I love seeing patients every day. But there is a part of it that needs to be changed. And that part is that for the first 25 years of my career, I thought my MD was less than anybody else's MD. I thought that me as a doctor was less of an important, significant, reliable, consistent, credible human being than anybody else with an MD. And I'll tell you why I did that. And I didn't understand it until one day when my confidence changed and I was like, wait a minute, I, my MD is the same as anybody else's MD. It was from my teaching, from my educational process. And at 25 year anniversary, um, the year before the 25th anniversary, Lou Kriegler invited me to become part of the Alumni Association 
and recruit people so we would show strength in the 25th anniversary. And you know what? I, did, I came on board and I brought in about 60, 70 people and we had a really great showing in the year 2000. And it was wonderful. And that's when I actually realized everybody was talking about how horrible medical training was. And that's when I realized that, you know, I was discounting it because I, when I wrote the letter to them, I said, listen, your having an MD affected everything you do. It changes your life. It makes you who you are as a person. It actually defines you. No matter how hard you try to think that it doesn't define you, it does define you. That MD is who you are. And you know what? I kind of fought that because I didn't want that MD that was trained to not care, that was brainwashed by keeping us up at all hours of the night and day, by that MD that came with so much blood, sweat, and tears, that MD that was like the embarrassment of making a mistake and being yelled at in front of by your peers, that MD to me was so precious and so important that I was willing to overlook everything that took me there. Well, we don't have to overlook it anymore. I think it's time for a change in healthcare and in medicine. And in the book, I do a very interesting thing, I think. I tell stories. I tell three kinds of stories. They're the stories which are my experience and my evolution as a doctor, and it goes through the 30-something years. I mean, I've been a doctor for 40 plus years, so I'm not afraid of being a doctor anymore. I'm not embarrassed of having an MD, because for 15 years at least, I was embarrassed of being a doctor. When people call me doctor, I'd like, cringe, because I felt that people thought I was a haughty, you know, self-serving, godlike creature, which I'm not. I'm a human being like everybody else. Like, my patients and I are the same. And by the way, some of you who've been patients may actually remember what it feels like. Anyway, so the thing is that I now turn around and wrote the stories of how I got to be the doctor I am. And you know what? The right decisions sometimes are the wrong ones. And one story is the story of me being a resident and getting a patient in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm sorry again, the students are not here because it's an important story, that at 3 o'clock in the morning I get this woman, my, you know, older woman who has a saddle embolus and I figure it out instantly because she was dying, and I drag the um, angio resident out of his bed, on call room bed, and I take him to do the angio so that I can prove to Dr. Lyons, for those of you who remember, that the next, the next morning that I have the diagnosis, so I wouldn't be yelled at, how do you think that she died? And, I, and the woman dies on the cold angio table. And then I think it's great because I got my diagnosis and I run over there, I present to the morning report, and guess what? I'm a hero. But you know what? It just didn't feel right. It took me 20 years to get it. But I tell you what, she could have been my mother. I, I behaved like a jerk. I behaved horribly by being so evidence-based, based. that's it. All that mattered was get the evidence because that's how I was trained. I was yelled at if I didn't produce at that level. And I produced because I was a great student. You know, I was thinking when Dr. Williams introduced me about all the, you know, these, these great achievements, how come I'm not an academician? And I tell you why, because academics doesn't feel right. Academics doesn't care. It teaches you not to care. That's why I stayed in private practice. Because in private practice, I could actually be myself. And I could care. So anyway, so there's, there's the stories in the book from that perspective. The perspective of me as a doctor and my evolution as a human being from that obedient medical student, resident to who I am today, which is a caring human being who happens to have an MD after her name. Then the second stories are the, you know, they're stories from my patients, other doctors who have actually insisted on being in the book. They've asked me to put them in the book because they, everybody has a story. So I, their stories. And then there's another group of stories which will suit every one of you in academic medicine because you know what? It's the story of what we know as facts. 
what the statistics show, what the reality of healthcare in America is. So I speak about insurance companies and everything we know about how the medical industrial complex has been created by insurance companies taking over and how they, the biggest scam under the sun, have actually destroyed healthcare. I also speak about how you know, the statistics on the truth about healthcare in America is that we're kind of number 26 after Slovenia when it comes to infant mortality and it comes to life expectancy. We're not so great. You know, when politicians get up and start saying how fantastic healthcare is here, you should boo them. You know, that's not really the truth. They, we're not there. I mean, these are all, everything I wrote that are scientific data, statistically proven, evidence-based data, are all referenced at the end of the book. And then it's about the drug companies, the over-the-counter drug companies, and how everyone is bought and sold by drug companies, how over-the-counter, how, the, how do these big chains have the audacity to put in medical facilities in their, in their facility, you go into the Rite Aid and, and Walgreens and you have a doctor or a PA sitting there writing a script that you could fill there so they don't lose you. It's insane, direct to the, pa to the patient, to the public advertising, which finally the AMA came up and said, well, we don't want this anymore, but I don't know what took them so long, because in 97, when they came up with this, it was insane. It wasn't about questioning the doctor's authority, it was actually about creating a world where they sell and you just have to prescribe. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. So I wrote about that and I wrote about hospitals. I wrote about the truth about hospitals. The lack of transparency in healthcare, which is actually one of the worst things that we could have done. Doctors do not report other doctors, whether they're impaired, whether they're horrible to each other, whether they lie, whether, it doesn't matter. There's a conspiracy of silence, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not. I actually, that's why, I, you know, I always thought I was less than anybody else, because I never thought there was a conspiracy out there to make it bad. So this is the thing. I wrote about the drug companies and the hospitals and what the relationship between is, and how, you know, deadly infections, how hundreds of thousands of people die of preventable, of PAEs, preventable, diseases and, and they're acquired in the hospital and how the hospitals are actually the last place you should go to get care and guess what? Where do we train our medical students? To go to the hospital. What do we do with our medical students? We beat the living daylights out of them to submit, to, into submission. We treat them so badly. You know, my partner was telling me a story the other day which was unbelievable, which you know what? The fact that when in the emergency room, emergency room attendings are, are afraid to call other attendings to give them admissions. And in this particular case, it was a neurosurgeon. And that the only way they would call them so that they wouldn't get screamed at, abused, yelled at, is on a, a recorded line. That's horrific. This is the world of doctors. And you know what? We killing ourselves, and I think that's part of what this is about. Let's stop killing ourselves. So this is basically the perspectives of the book. But it's a positive book, actually, because I'm a very positive person. And I also believe that we can make it work. And we can make it work really well. And while it seems to be a runaway train, you could turn around and you could really stop it. It's up to each and every one of us. So the th common thread through the book is really the stories that take a patient from being the perfect patient who just listens to the doctor no matter what the doctor has to say, who will go undergo tests and undergo all kinds of procedures and anything the doctor says without question, to the empowered patient, which is not a perfect patient, who questions. I teach patients. Don't bully the doctor because they're going to get scared of you and they're not going to take care of you. So it's not about creating bullies. It's about giving people ownership of their own health because none of us doctors know what's going on inside another human being. We're actually fortunate if we know what's going on inside ourselves 
and it takes decades to figure that one out. And most of the time, we don't get it anyway. So to listen to someone else who doesn't even take their noses out of the EMR, to look at you, to make eye contact, to care about you, is not a good thing. So giving people the power to actually realize that they shouldn't be afraid of the doctor, because the doctor doesn't have anything. In fact, they may have some information that may or may not apply to them. So at the end of the day, it's really about the individual patient. So I take it from the perfect patient and help people by giving them all this information about facts and stories that they may identify with and help them become empowered patients. And because I think that there, it's time for a revolution in healthcare, and the revolution starts with you and the patient, I, I gave, the, uh, there is a patient manifesto and a doctor manifesto at the, in the end of the book. And if you read them, you will see that they actually set both of us free. It sets us both free to come together, to work as a team, not to be intimidated or afraid, but rather to work as advocates for each other, to support each other, to eliminate the fear of malpractice that makes you make, do tests that are horrific and unnecessary. Because you know what? If you talk to a patient like a human being and they know that you know them and care about them, they don't expect you to do 2,000 tests to find a disease. And maybe we focus on prevention. And we focus on something that we weren't taught in medical school, which is how do we prevent disease. And yes, I have news for you, Dr. Salwin, diet matters. What you put in your mouth affects what comes out. You know, it's so important to realize that things that we so arbitrarily decide don't matter, do matter. Diet, exercise, lifestyle, stress management, care, how you work in your relationships with people, how you interact, how you connect, that makes a difference. Most of disease that you see here is not what the reality is over there. The reality is that long before people come down with serious illnesses, you can protect them, you can help prevent them. And this is really the message of the book. It's an empowering message. The book, ironically, and I didn't expect it because I, I haven't done much PR for it, is now in its fourth printing and has been out for one month. Shocking. Now you're going to say, of course it is because of the title. <laughs> and I would imagine that it has something to do with it. But you know what? The title is really not what you expect it to be. What, what it's about. You know, when you read the book, you're going to get, oh, it's all smashing doc bashing doctors. But it's not. It's empowering doctors. It's giving us the tools to not be afraid because, you know what, we're even more afraid than the patients. That's why we have allowed insurance companies, drug companies, everybody's special interests, all about the money, and it will allow politics and money to rule us. So if you say no to politics and no to money, you, shockingly, you'll find out that it works. It works really well. So that's the story of the book. And I hope that you guys read the book, because it's meant for you. So I have to tell you one more thing about the title, and then I'm going to ask you, because there's so few of us here, that we're going to ask questions. I'll feel fine. I feel like you actually listened to something. <laughs> anyway, but this is the thing. Um, I was on the elevator. I, I gave a talk at the uh, they, they did a book signing for me at Neiman's in White Plains. So we brought some of the, they, we sold some books and then we came back and we, I was on the elevator in, at my, in my building and um, it's a small building in, in the city and there's this guy who's a tall, elderly, white gentleman and he stands there and he presses, there, there are only 10 floors and 10 businesses there. Press is number nine, and everything else is either Prada or, uh, <laughs> or art galleries. And this one happens to be uh, money, an uh, investment thing. So the guy presses the investment thing. So I go, oh, OK. So I pick up one of the books, and I say, hey, would you like one of these books? The guy jumps back, literally, as if I was going to kill him, literally. Like I was like hitting him with something. So I said to him, I said, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote this book. I mean, I, why, you know, why don't you want it? And he looked at me and he said, I don't want to read about that. 
I said, well, why don't you, you don't even know what's in it. So he said, I don't want to read anything about that. There's your perfect patient. That's the guy who's going to get killed. That one. And let's make sure that you are not the perfect patient. That you're the empowered patient, and you empower your own patients. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Anybody have any questions? There's a question, yes. You mentioned that you have opened an office in England. Uh huh. Any lessons in comparison with the Spanish between how Yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, they have social, everything, they socialize medicine. And when the Daily Mail serialized that they took out anything to do with insurance, and they only serialized the parts which are about doctor-patient relationship, about medical education, and you know, the drug thing. Um, I think people in, in Europe, and I hate to say England is Europe, I'm sorry, Ken, <laughs> I don't think it's Europe. But anyway, it's an island off the coast of Europe. <laughs> anyway, I think in England, people are a lot more open-minded. And there are a lot, you know, doctors are not afraid. But they're just as rigid and nasty to the patients, which is horrible. And the thing is that they're not afraid because the malpractice crisis has not hit them yet. But it's also because of the system, they don't have the latitude to just willy-nilly do a million tests. Not that we weren't doing it in the 70s and 80s, because when people came in, we just drew 2,000 gallons of blood on everybody trying to find something wrong. So I remember that. But the difference is they're much more open-minded and they're much more desperately seeking the relationship. Where, you know, where you guys are here, I think it, you have to foster the relationship. Where I fortunately am, I only have relationships. But in England, they come seeking. They come looking for the relationship. And also, they have this fantasy, which is fantasy, that doctors from America know better, which is a huge fantasy. But they love us because we're American. Um, I think that the system actually, there's a lot to be learned from that system. I also see, you know, I, I, I try my best to see both sides of every coin. And, you know, and even the room. Anyway, but this is the thing. There's a lot to learn. Because of the limited f funds that are attributed to it, allocated to them. I think that what I saw, I see a lot is people have to wait. And because they have to wait, you want a CAT scan? You gotta wait. So if you want, have to wait, then something happens. It actually starts gently and automatically kind of turning inside. And the patients own their health better. I mean, there's some, of course, who are gonna run outside the system and get their CAT scan and then, you know, there are a lot of exceptions to the rule, but in general, what I think is they're slower to react. And I think, and I wrote about it in the book, you know, the power of not doing, as you know, that the power of not doing is huge. That in an emergency situation, when it's life or death, by all means, you're screwed if you don't do. But the power of not doing and waiting, the body is a beautiful thing. It heals itself. And I tell you, 40 years later, I'm amazed how beautiful the body is, and how well it heals itself, and how if we don't poke and prod it, it does well with the right diet, exercise, support, etc. So there, they're forced into that situation. They don't show up with later cancers, more spread out you know, cancers. They don't die of heart disease more than our people die. But I tell you what they do. They own their health care a lot better. They may not like their doctors, but then, you know what? I think that's horrible. They should like their doctors. I think everybody should like their doctors. It'll make them healthier. You know, there's study after study, and I wrote in the book, all these studies that show that doctors that have relationships with their patients, the patients do better, unequivocally. It's not like we have to prove it. It's proven. So there, I think it's more wait, relax. And i tell you something else. I just thought of another piece. I work in, in the, the, where we have the offices, the Queen's doctor's there. <laughs> so he has a lot of patients, of course, by virtue of who he is, and he's a lovely guy. And he says that a lot of doctors, and he sees that all the time, behave the same in and outside the system. 
So if they're working for their system, they'll see 2,000 patients a day and do what people do here nonstop. Then they leave and they go in their private practices because everybody has a private practice. And in the private practice, for 10 times the amount of money, they do exactly the same thing. They just can get them in for tests and procedures faster. But that's it. They still talk down to the patient. They're still arrogant. And you know, back to here in the, in the book, I wrote about Dr. Pronovost, who happens to be the, the chief of the safety and patient safety at Johns Hopkins, who's been writing for 30 years in JAMA and everywhere research on what is the biggest stumbling block in improving healthcare. And consistently, it's physician arrogance. And it's not me, it's Johns Hopkins, peer reviewed, and there's actually a journal, I don't even know if you know about it, the, patient, the um, Journal of Patient Safety, which nobody reads. Have you ever heard of it? Anybody heard of this? Oh, look, that, yes, four people. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, so I think it's, you know, the only difference is they slow down and they're more eager to communicate, to connect. Here I feel like there's kind of people have abandoned all hope. They live in fear of being diagnosed with a disease and or missing a disease. They own diseases and it's a mess. And we just, the medical profession just reinforces it. And, and then the other thing, I wanted to tell you one more thing, you, you reminded me something else. There, I read this article from 2013, um, this guy, the National Review, I think it was, and it's about a doctor, his name I think was Ryan? I don't know. Anyway, a doctor who was a retired f physician um, wrote the story of how doctors die. And I think that's an important piece. You read it, right? So this is, a, you know, the fact that doctors do not have the tests. Doctors don't become an, enmeshed and then don't fall into the pit of disease obsession and diagnostic, you know, diagnosis obsession and testing obsession. That for the most part, doctors just kind of hang their shingle, hang their white coats, or if they wear one, and just move on and just kind of do whatever they can do to enjoy their, their life. Because at the end of the day, we all die. And I'm sure you read Atul Gawande's book about you know, being, on being mortal, which is we have to accept in this country the fact that we die. And as such, we don't have to like, keep on keeping people alive at all costs, but rather teach them to enjoy quality of life, enjoy their life. Who cares about another test and another drug? The only people who benefit from that is teaching the medical students how to poke another person. And that doesn't make sense because you're turning them into robots, not human beings. So I think that this has nothing to do with it. It was an important article that doctors actually don't follow what they preach, which is really kind of, are we that dishonorable that we really don't follow what we preach? It's pretty sad. Anyway, hopefully now we do. Yes? Do you think now with the new push on cultural competency coming from the... Thank you. Uh, do you think now with the push on cultural competency coming from hospital accrediting bodies like Joint Commission, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, their class standards, even the AAMC is touting it with respect to implementing it in the medical school curriculum, that uh, we might begin to change the narrative in, in healthcare and patient care? I, I, listen, I'm an optimist. I wrote this book not to, to deep six the system because it's already in the gutter. I mean, it's totally a mess. I wrote this book to empower people and to note for the doctors, for us to change our behavior and to bond with the patients. This book is all about that. I, you know, and I'm talking about you know, medical schools and when they started and how they were all about you know, you know, white men and you know, now it's changing. I mean, the most diverse medical school in the country is here and I think it's time and I think that the more we make, you know, create doctors that can represent their own ethnic groups and the more 
we respect each other, the better doctors we become. And people do better. So I think it's all about really focusing on the doctor-patient relationship and caring. So one of my patients, I texted her this morning and I said to her, so what do you think that would be three takeaways from what I'm saying today to this group? And she said, well, the patients want to be listened to. Please, get the message. People want to be noticed. That's what the book is about. You're killing people by discarding them, by not looking at them, by not knowing them. That's how we're killing people. And we're killing ourselves. And you know that doctors have the highest incidence of suicide, the highest incidence of depression in any profession the highest incidence of dropping out, and you know why? Because we're not supporting each other. And if we supported each other, and then had relationships that are fulfilling with the patients, and we aren't afraid of the patients, and don't, aren't in panic mode of like, you know, getting sued, guess what happens? We thrive, they thrive, and the system cannot get us. You know, how did we allow insurance companies to take over? How? I'd like to know how we allowed this to happen. The only reason we allowed it is because we didn't care. You know, we just worried about our own little, you know. That, you know, how did the drug companies do this to us? How? We allowed it. We allowed drug companies to take over our whole system. How did medical schools, where people should be nurtured, People should be helped to feel great about themselves because the achievement, just getting out of 750,000 people applied to medical school, 20,000 get in. I mean, how could we not nurture these people, make them feel great about themselves? Why don't we hold their hands and, and hug them and give them positive reinforcement? Because you know what? Then you'll create doctors who can give back in kindness. You know, there is a student um, network online, uh, a chat kind of thing, I know, SND it's called, Student Doctor Network, and there was, then I wrote in the book, this particular uh, person wrote, uh, this guy or gal, wrote this thing about that medical school is like an abusive parent. It's like an abusive relationship with a parent. And what it does is the parent abuses you and as you're a child, as you're growing up, and then when you grow up, you become an abuser. And, you know, I read the comments that he got, and this is like six, seven years ago that this happened, and that he wrote that, and now it's like a lot more pervasive. I mean, everybody writes that. Everybody hates it now. And the thing is that it's true. Why are we bad parents? I mean, I'm sure at home, most of you aren't arrogant, nasty, uncaring parents. I think you probably coddle your kids. Why don't we coddle the medical students? Why do we think that giving them negative reinforcement is going to work? It doesn't work. I think it's just dinosaurish and it's time to erase it. You know, I think it's time to kind of march in the streets and get the doctors and the patients together and stop the insanity and make it all about caring for each other. We'll do well. I promise we do it. I prove it every single day in the practice we have, in everything I do. It's positive. Just switch it. Yes. Who? Yeah, sure. Hi, Juan. Hi. <laughs> um, you might have just answered this, but there are some medical students in the audience, and even after a few months, it does seem kind of inevitable becoming consumed by the medical industrial complex. So do you have any advice on how we can retain our compassion and not end up, you know, hating ourselves and our patients. Are you a first year student? Yeah. Ah, so you were at the white coat address, huh? Yeah. Thanks. Well, just hold on to what I taught you there, you know. But this is the thing. You can hold on to your humanity. The problem with medical school, and I think it's going to change, is that there's no course about how are you feeling as a medical student. There is no one who's giving you support so that you could survive as a positive. You know, as I said, and I say it all the time, when I was on the board, you know, the committee of admissions committee, I have never in my life interviewed a prospective medical student who went in saying, oh, I want to be famous and I want to be 
um, arrogant and I want to be nasty and I just want to put down everybody else. Everybody comes in wanting to save the world. So how do you take people who want to save the world and turn them into uncaring, unkind people? It's the brainwashing cult environment of medical school. So this is the thing. You don't have to join the cult part. You don't. You could create around yourself, literally, a bubble where you, you, can, you become Teflon when it comes to abuse. And when somebody is abusive, you confront them. They're not going to throw you out. They'll be leaving before you do. If somebody is abusive to you, do not ever be afraid of saying, that's not nice. Why are you talking to me this way? Don't be afraid. You know, the, the um, recorded line is all over now. Everything is in full sight. You know, the lack of transparency is disappearing. I wouldn't be standing here in front of you if things weren't changing. You'd have one of the others standing in front of you if things weren't changing. So you are our hope. You are the future. And I wrote in the book about the new breed of doctors. And the new breed of doctors care. You know, unfortunately in my generation, you have to kind of beat it out of them. <laughs> but then you become an abuser, so I can't do that. It's just that with kindness and support, you keep on pointing it out. And some of them get it and some of them don't. But invariably, the people I mentor and the people I work with get it. And they realize that all the evidence-based medicine and all the protocols are worthless the moment you lose care and empathy. So hold on to it. Remind yourself. Stay connected to the outside world, you know, because part of the cult brainwashing of medical school is that it isolates you from the outside world because there's so much study and so much to be done, you know. So this is the thing. What you want to do is you want to keep the contact with the outside world and check in with yourself. Check in. You know, stay connected to yourself. You know, I hate to say meditate, but the truth is there's a great meditation app that I found a few, about a year ago, called Headspace. And I've been following it, and it's amazing, because it take, you take 10 minutes out of your day where you actually get in touch with yourself. And you know what, if you, get, if you feel good about yourself and your self-confidence builds rather than gets destroyed, because that's obviously what happened to me. My self-confidence was destroyed because I didn't even want to have an, you know, I was so scared everybody else knew more than I did. Nobody knows anything because every one of us is an individual. At the end of the day, you're only as good as the last patient you made well. That's it. And you know what? The glory of it lies in the individual patient. You know, that's why I stayed in clinical practice because I feel best when I see a patient and I know they're okay and they tell me they love me and I tell them I love them. And if you can stay there, you'll be fine. And if you lose it, which I did, and a lot of people do, if you lose it, you'll get it back. Just get through the years, try not to get abused, and don't own the abuse. Don't let anybody own the, you know, push it into you. Keep it at a distance and then you'll be fine. I am sure you'll be one of those doctors who won't kill you or kill themselves. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Share it with everybody in your class. Yes. Oh, Dr. Sadowski. Yay. Dr. Schwartz, you know, there's a troubling trend going on in the name of access to physicians, which has to do with the use of electronics. And computing elect uh, communicating electronically and by computers with your physician. And it's all being done with the idea that help to improve communication because you'll be able to communicate in a more uh, timely manner. What do you think about this trend that uh, electronics are replacing face-to-face -face communication? Well, you're going to love hearing that. I was one of the first people who did this. <laughs> so this is what I think. I think that when you, the doctor has no relationship with the patient, it doesn't matter if they're standing in front of the patient, they won't see them. So I think that whether you're doing it by phone or text or in person, at the end of the day, I think the troubling thing is that there's no more physical examinations. 
that uh, that's the part that disturbs me the most, that somebody has a pain someplace, goes into the doctor, and the doctor never examines them. That's the part where I have a problem, that if you're seeing, I mean, people send me pictures of things that they have on their bodies, and I do diagnose by, via text and email, but I have a relationship with these people. I think that, you, that the danger, which is what you raise, is the fact that it puts even more distance because you don't even have to see them, you have nothing to do with them, you're just answering them. But I think that the people who don't care will not care. And the people who care will care. So I think that I started literally this online stuff a long time ago. And you know what? It helped people that had no access to doctors like myself or doctors in general. I mean, in, in England, what we started is like literally we have online consultations with people who live, I mean, we have to actually look it up on the map to figure out where it is, places that have no access. So I think that there's good and bad in everything. And I think that if we can open our minds to the good and not always look for the bad, we'll do much better. And I think that, you know, I know you're a fantastic doctor because I've known you my whole life, basically. And I know you care. And I think that that's what defines you as a human being. And I think that because you see people and you touch people, that's where you, your level of comfort sits. And I think it's great for you. And again, each one of us are individuals. Each one of us are in different places. And I think if it comes from the right place, it probably works. And if it, you know, and I was, I did USA the other day, um, and they wanted five tips on how to protect your family in healthcare. And one of them was that, that I gave them was, and it, they, they literally gave me one minute to prepare for this thing. And I said, one of the things, and Josh was with me, thank God, <laughs> came up with five, but one of them was, if it doesn't feel right, just don't do it. And this is the thing, we have learned not to listen to our gut, because the way we were trained in medical school was override your gut, just listen to, you know, what does the science say, what does the literature say, what's the protocol, and you know what, humans are not protocols, that's the problem, that public health is where the protocols and evidence-based medicine came from, which is great, because there are people who otherwise would have no access, and we couldn't train them, because after the Flexner report, if you all remember, I wasn't there yet, something I was born after, <laughs> shockingly, that after that they wanted to, everything has to be uniform and standardized. Okay, so that's a good way to start somewhere, and I have that debate with Josh all the time about, we follow protocols with the hormones, and it's a place to start, which is fine. But then when somebody's sitting in front of you, or you're working with someone even remotely, I mean, we do a lot of Skype too. You know, even remotely, it's an individual. The protocol sits here. What comes out is what you've learned about the human being. And if the person doesn't feel that it makes sense, they shouldn't do it. I mean, because we don't live inside of them. And I think that that's really the most important thing, is we don't live inside of them, so they should not listen. If it feels right, do it. And you know, then there's so many different philosophies in healthcare. You know, there was alternative medicine, which we managed to look down upon because they're not evidence-based. There are all these things that we don't understand anything about. So instead of putting them down, what we should do is open our minds and accept that we don't know very much of anything. But what we do know is how we, could, how we treat other people. The only thing we really know is how we behave. So anyway, so to answer that, if it works for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. Yeah. Excuse me, first is a comment. Oh and my God, Monica, I didn't even realize it's you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Schwartz. Oh yeah, right. First is a comment and then a question. First comment is thank you for all of your great representation of the class of 75 <laughs> that you've been doing a long time. And secondly, um, that they say, uh, fake it until you can make it. No one ever thought of you as anything except confident and in charge. So. You faked it for a long time, and now you've made it, so congratulations. <laughs> uh, the question is... I don't know that. <laughs> See? Now that we are where we are with health insurance companies and HMOs telling you you have 12 minutes to see a person, 
and you have to tell me your top interest for today, your top uh, complaint for today, or you can't, you can't go down the list of anything. And you can't get paid for this if you do something outside of uh, protocols. So my question is, from where we are today, where, how do you think, and I know you can't say everything, but one or two uh, suggestions about where we want to go to get to where we need to be. Um, because medicine has gone in the wrong direction now for uh, two or three decades. So to turn it around so doctors are in charge of their patients when they're with them, more than the HMO and the boardroom, where do you think and how do you think we can start addressing it? That's an excellent question, and I address it actually in the book. So this is what I think. I think that there are two pieces to the whole thing. One of them is the patient, and the other one is us, the doctors. And I think the patients, once they stop being the perfect patient, once they're scared, stop being scared, once they're like obsessively looking that for us not to miss something, once their adversarial relationship ends, and that's all totally controllable from our end, because it's how we behave because we enable them to either be like defensive and scared and create a nightmare, and I wrote about it, uh, or they'll just become empowered and they'll go, you know what, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, it's my life, I'll make the decisions. You're just gonna guide me if you're gonna be the right doctor for me. If not, just move on. There are enough of us, it's not to worry. The, the harder question is how do we as doctors change what we allowed? to take control and take hold and destroy the medical profession. And I think it starts with, again, with us, how we interact with each other. Putting away politics and stopping it. Having the same goal, which is getting together. You know when the malpractice crisis was in the 80s, I guess, early 80s, right? No, 90s, early 90s. Right, in the early 90s? Early 90s, early 90s. And there were doctors, you know, where I was, I was at Westchester Medical, and there were doctors, go, you know, they marched on Albany and they got together. And at home, there were all these guys who were seeing our patients. Because they didn't want to miss out on making the money. And because they didn't believe that, you know, we could get together. And they were right. Think of how long it took for the Committee of Intern and Residents to come together. Decades of trouble, you know, not sleeping. So I think it's about actually the doctors not bad-mouthing each other anymore. I mean, I spend my time teaching doctors in my practice and, you know, coordinating practice, teaching doctors how not to bad-mouth each other. They constantly bad-mouth each other. And it's if we stop the politics, if we stop the jockeying for power, I think we'll see a change. I think if you go together as a group and say to the insurance companies, to any kind of, the, to the legislature, to anybody as a group and say, we're not going to do this anymore, and there's no traitor in the background, you'll see a huge change. You'll, you can make the change now, but it starts with each and every one of us. That's it, each and every one of us. And you know what? We may not like the person that's next to you. You don't have anybody next to you. But this is the thing. You may not like them. You may not agree with them on everything. But this is the thing. United we stand. Divided we fall. And we've fallen. We have fallen. So it's how do we pick ourselves up or just get out of the business? Clearly, I wasn't ready to get out of business. You clearly weren't ready to retire. So this is the thing. We actually still have it in us. So if we have it in us, let's get united. Not against the patient, but against the bigger master. Because the only master we have is the patient, should be the patient. The moment the master we have is political, money-driven, insurance company, drug company, hospital politics, the moment that was your master, we lose. We lose and the patients lose. So it's time to say, hey, I only work for the patient. You know, I was lucky, I got out. I mean, I went and I said, no insurance, no nothing. I either work with my patient or I'm out of the business. And I was gonna be an actress. No, just kidding. <laughs> I was just kidding. No, so this is the thing. I think it, you could do, we could do it. I think that this is what I'm aiming. This is kind of my cry to action. 
my call to action. You know, let's start the revolution together. Thank you.